Muchas gracias por sus palabras eh, tan generosas, las bienvenidas. Eh, siempre frente a una introducción eh, de ese estilo, eh, no hay nada más que eh, dejar una impresión de decepción. Um, y espero que, eh, que ustedes eh, presentes eh, no salgan decepcionados. Um, les pido, además, eh, perdón que mi presentación va a estar en, en, eh, en inglés eh, por razones de tiempo y como hace falta, hace, no, hace una, unos cuantos años que no hago una conferencia en español, decidí mejor ser más eh, o menos confuso en inglés, eh, eh, pero la conversación la podemos hacer eh, en español. Um, so, thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you, Leandro, for, for pulling this together and uh, for your wonderful generosity and hospitality at the foundation. Uh, so, I'm going to talk to you this evening about a project um, that I am finishing, um, uh, about a book about togetherness. Uh, and about our ambivalence, about being together on one closed unit in the universe called the planet Earth. Adam Smith once said that 1492 was the most important year in world history. Uh, and here you have uh, the image of a Portuguese carrick in the early 17th century aligned with uh, a scheduled airline traffic map from 2009, uh, five centuries later. We live in an age now in which many people wonder whether what has been built up over those five centuries is beginning to crack up. We can call this globalization fatigue. And in fact, we are living at the end of a long cycle of global integration. Since 1945, uh, we have never been more uh, integrated. We depend upon each other over long distances more uh, than we ever have. Strangers need us, and we need strangers. And let me find the clicker here, actually. I should check to see if this works. We. Oui. Okay. Uh, this is this, the cover of this week's uh, Economist magazine, to give you an example. We are familiar with the story of trade and our dependence on trade relations with other corners of the earth. Of course, the prominence of climate change uh, reminds us of the ways in which what strangers do in China affects how we live on coastlines in Europe and the United States, and vice versa. That we have as Adam Smith would say, a self-interest in what other people do. A self-interest in the lives of strangers. They buy our goods, we buy their goods, they make goods for us and we make goods for them. Their carbon addiction has effects on our weather. I don't know if that's what caused the, my plane problems in Brussels this morning, uh, and, and vice versa. And of course, the last example, something we were talking about earlier uh, today, uh, is of course from the migrant uh, crisis. That is a worldwide crisis. I, I've come from a country that is now deeply, deeply divided over the question of immigration. So global integration poses uh, limits on social integration within our countries and across countries. And I just remind you that though we've come out of, uh, in the United States, a long period of a historic paralysis of uh, the government, it was like parts of the government services were actually shut down over whether to build, to fund and to build a wall that would separate the United States from Mexico. But if the first two examples, let's say trade and climate change, are about our self-interest in strangers and strangers' self-interest in what we do, the migrant crisis poses as one of compassion 
for strangers. It's not just a story about interests. It's also a story about compassion. So the question for us is how can we think about the relationship between what Adam Smith called our interests and our sympathies? What he meant was, was compassion. Uh, and he, because he believed that the more integrated be, we became, the more interdependent we became, the more strangers depended on us, and the more we depended on strangers, the more there would be mutual understanding across these lines. That was central to Adam Smith's thinking. It was central to one way of thinking about how markets function. In other words, how can we be more interdependent and more exhausted at the same time. We need strangers, yet the societies that need them are rife with rejection, with exit, with nation-first chest-thumping. We are going through the most profound malaise over global integration since the 1930s. Now, tomorrow at um, Carlos Tercero, I'm going to uh, talk much more about what we can learn from the last time a global interdependent order broke down, which was the 1930s, and produced the horror uh, of, the, uh, of that decade. But this evening, what I want to do is to share some ideas about a historical perspective on our age of anxiety. Our age, when compassion and self-interest seem so deeply split. And the question arises then, is this the end of globalization? The photograph on uh, the right of that slide is one I took uh, a few weeks ago uh, on the Champs-Élysées in the wake of a demonstration from the Gilets Jaunes. So is globalization over? That might be one takeaway from uh, this, uh, this discussion. I would argue no. Globalization is not over, but that we are going through some very profound growing pains. And it can, those growing pains, can become a more full-blown crisis like the one that occurred after 1929, if we don't watch out. So we live in a confused and conflicted age. And what prolongs some of the agony is that we have a hard time fathoming it. Hard time figuring out what is going on. What is the story of our age? I believe that two things stand in the way. The first is that we are caught in what I will call a narrative impasse. There's a blockage of the kinds of stories that we're able to tell each other about uh, inter interdependence. And the second is that we have a hard time understanding a fundamental paradox of globalization. So this evening, I'm going to make two arguments. The first is about our stories, our narratives. And the second is about the history of an ambivalence about needing strangers that tells us a story, it reveals us something about globalization that I believe we have been in denial of. I want to show you how this history of our complex relationship to strangers how we need strangers and how they need us. Strangers understood as people far away, but upon whom we depend and vice versa. And if we can understand that, we can begin to explore the possibilities of a new narrative of our togetherness. Why? Well, it's because the old more familiar story of globalization, the one that has dominated the landscape since the 1990s, is no longer compelling enough to help us move to the challenges of the 21st century. It lacks social support, it lacks legitimacy, and it cripples then our ability to tackle shared challenges. It is also tearing at our democratic fabric. Since 2008, and most certainly since 2015, our political systems are being torn apart by discord over global visions, over the story of our interdependence. And we are caught then between old arguments of globalization, 
the one that became familiar to us in the 1990s, that don't work anymore, and the appeal of the backlash. I'll get to them in just a minute. So we need an alternative case for global integration, one that is honest about the problems that globalization produces. So as I said, we're caught in a narrative impasse, a blockage between the stories that we tell about our interdependence with strangers. Since 2008, 2015, for sure, we've been living in a world long on arguments, but short on understandings. So the question we might pose is, why narratives? Why do narratives matter? Surely there's, it's really a story about material interests. This is something perhaps we can talk about in the discussion. I'll make, let me make two cases for why narratives are important. First is that they, sh they frame our shared identities. What Roger Smith, a political philosopher, calls our stories of peoplehood and our relationships with our neighbors or the people we feel are connected to us. They define the boundaries, these narratives then define the boundaries of who is inside the story, who is the we that make us. So it's a story about our identity. Narratives also have an economic function. Uh, in, uh, without getting technical about this, although if you want, we can get technical about it in the conversation if, 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 if you're interested, they reduce transaction costs. That stories yield externalities. The more we share common frames of references in the stories about what brings us together, the easier it is to do business together. In some sense, it's the inverse of what Adam Smith argued. Adam Smith argued the more we trade together, the more we can develop mutual understanding. The more mutual understanding we get, the more we develop a shared story. And one might say that the process can equally be, be explained the other way around. Develop a shared narrative, engage in more inter-exchange between strangers, and, um, and you get prosperity. So, sharing references lowers the cost of doing business within societies and across societies. One of the very strong enabling conditions of the post-1945 decades, and here I'm speaking very globally, of course, every country is going to have its own relationship to how it managed the post-Second World War years, and I'm very aware that Spain had its own history. But that, um, one of the enabling conditions for global integration after 1945 was the memory of depression and war. It fueled a sense of common purpose. In fact, the invention of the category of the West came very much as a result of that crisis and produced what we know of as the Trente Glorieuse, those 30 years of uh, bounty, prosperity, spreading democracy. So prosperity, peace, democracy spread in those decades that followed the Second World War. We can speculate, and maybe this is something to talk about uh, after this week, as we've lost a memory of those traumatic years of the 30s and 40s, we have lost some of the glue, the cement, that allowed elites and even popular sectors to transact and to enjoy legitimacy within and across borders. This, of course, was made worse by the spike, the rise, the sudden surge of perceived and real inequalities as the shared narratives that came out of the Second World War began to dissolve. Now, I should add that the West was not the only place where shared narratives were being uh, invented and concocted after 1945 for the last seven decades. Not just Westerners, but also Resterners, the people coming from other parts of the world, were also engaged in the pursuit of shared narratives that can join them within societies and across societies. The two dominant ones were, of course, the communist uh, narrative and the anti-colonial narrative. 
They also helped legitimate the power of elites and create a sense of uh, future uh, possibilities and mobilize societies for common purpose, even if in many of these cases it was highly coercive. There was a certain irony to this relationship between these, in a sense, rivalry of the narratives between the post-colonial third world effort to be independent from empires, a communist project, and let's say the Western project for democratic capitalism as three powerful narratives about the future is that they were rivals. They competed with each other. And in competing with each other, gave each other significance. One might say that the unintended effect of the end of the Cold War and the final dismantling of Europe's empires in the rest of the world, in Africa, Asia, meant that there was no, was no more competition over the rivalry. Uh, there was no more competition between the rivals. And with no more rivalry, the one that was left standing lost its energy. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Well, what happened? I believe this appeal of these integrative narratives, um, particularly for the West, because that's where we're speaking from here, suffered from two blows. One was a good blow, of course, it was uh, the falling of uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, the democratic transitions um, um, that, that, that um, spread throughout the, the West. In 1989 was to produce what was called at the time the Flat Earth Story, or in its most euphoric version by Francis Fukuyama, a declaration of the end of history. Right? Um, that there was only, as people used to say in those days, only one game in town. There was only one story left. It was to adapt to market life, uh, uh, create uh, democratic regimes. Um, there was no other alternative. I have to say, just as kind of uh, parenthetic aside, that Francis Fukuyama, um, th the original title of that uh, intervention was called um, the end of history with a question mark at the end of it and everybody forgot the question mark. He was a little bit more concerned. Everybody thought of it as a very euphoric narrative. But if you go back and read him now, you can see, and of course now he's not euphoric at all. He's very pessimistic. But you can see that there is a strain of pessimism in his thinking, even as the Berlin Wall was coming down. Nonetheless, he got read a certain way, as having declared the end of history, no more alternative narratives, no more rivalry. Um, the flat earth narrative was coined by uh, the New York Times a journalist, uh, Thomas Friedman. But we might call the story of an alternativeless world, one in which we fold into one narrative and we're forced to share it, or go the way of the dodo bird, euphoria light. Right? But it had some traction and appeal. Right? It appeared to work, particularly in areas of the world that were the great beneficiaries of this opening, most importantly China. So that was a good side of the story, a good blow uh, to our narrative capacities. There was also a bad one, and it was the crisis of 2009. If 1989 flattened the world, 2009 turned the world upside down. And with several overlapping forces. The financial crisis, you're all very familiar with it, uh, worsening inequalities. Um, our growing evidence at the very same time of our, the, what the effects were of our carbon addiction and the effects on climate. So that it became increasingly aware that we desperately needed growth and recovery, but the growth and recovery damaged the planet. And we've been caught in this trap for the last decade. And so we swung from one narrative, the euphoric light 
narrative of no alternative now to another extreme that is the dys dysphoric light story where we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Right? And we've been swung from one and the other. For the dominant story right now is, whereas 30 years ago it was euphoric, is now catastrophistic. These are photographs I took um, the day before yesterday at the bookstore of my, on the table of my local bookstore to give you a sample of, the, of what's now selling in the marketplace of ideas. And my concern is that this narrative can become self-fulfilling, that our dysphorias will produce, our fear or narratives of dysphoria will produce dysphoria. Indeed, it was this catastrophistic storytelling that fueled the panic of the 1930s. There was an irony, right? Just as 1989 gave us one world, one story as euphoria light, now we have the reverse. So we've gone from euphoria to dysphoria. Both have compressed our narratives. Right? We, we don't have, as it were, a marketplace of narratives. We're stuck in one or uh, the other. The main beneficiaries of the age of disaster stories are the backlashers, right? the backlash club. They thrive off catastrophe. Going global means losing control. The only way out is to break with it, to break with a history of cooperative problem solving. Now, this is not anti-global, I should say. In spite of the rhetoric that you sometimes hear, not so much in Europe, but particularly in the United States, anti-globalism does not mean anti-globalization. Indeed, it's very important for us to understand that the backlash club want the benefits of interdependence with strangers, but without sharing the costs. Especially not the cost of recognizing the role of and responsibility to strangers. So they prefer a model of global interdependence that is extractive and predatory. This is not a model of inclusion, which had been the dominant story since 1945. And we have seen this before. In fact, in the long history of global integration, it's always been a gravity force. It's always been there, this temptation right, to move from inclusion to extraction. And I think it's important for us to understand this alternative model of interdependence, partly because of its growing uh, appeal in sectors of our societies. It has profoundly affected history in the past, as it is now, and because if we are going to come up with better stories for ourselves, we have to understand that. There has always been, then, a tension between two rivals, each equipped with their own story, let's say the competitive and the extractive model, its relationship to strangers, and the cooperative and the inclusive model. So the book that I'm writing is a history of how those two have competed with each other, sometimes mixing, sometimes colluding, sometimes standing off. The book is a defense, let's say a melancholic defense of globalism. It's a defense, not an epitaph, like most disaster narratives. It's melancholic because I am concerned that we are missing opportunities, especially after 1989 narrowed the range and appeal of our arguments to one that was solely based on a market logic. And the result of this 30 years of compression about the stories of our togetherness have left us with this. And now we are in a bind we are trying to widen the range of our narratives, but we have less capacity to understand them. It's a defense of globalism because I believe that we are better off together, if for no other reason than to defend the global commons and the global public goods. But it's a story that goes way back. It starts, um, it's a debate between these rival visions born, one might say, in 1848. The first to observe this problem 
were two people, two unlikely characters put together, Karl Marx and John Stuart Mill, who produced rival narratives and visions that connected the past to the present with visions of the future. At the core of the problem that both Marx and Mill saw, while they had very different stories about what they thought was going on, they did see the emergence of something new. And that is what happens when horizons of opportunities widen, but the bonds between people thin out. Okay, this is going to be important for what happens in the rest of this lecture. That there is a tension between widening the horizons of opportunity for trade, for migration, for investment, for families, but thinning the bonds of our relationship between the people we know at home. There was a happy version of the narrative, this was John Stuart Mills, that he saw the opening of opportunities as becoming more important than the thinning of the bonds of the relationships between people. The gloomy narrative, of course, no one better than Karl Marx, for whom, yes, widened opportunities, but it's really all about exploitation and alienation. So for him, what would dominate the story was the thinning of the bonds and the moral attachments between people. Let's dwell on the happy narrative, because it's the one that we'd associate with pro-globalization in recent decades, right? It was the one that framed what was so good about post-1989. But it did not reckon with three consequences. It needed, it, 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 it neglected three important effects of integration. And we need to understand these. We need to understand these in order to understand the backlash. And these are, we need to understand what interdependence between strangers, what the widening and the thinning does. And these are the three forces. If, you, if there's anything you're going to take notes on, which you don't have to do, uh, it should be from this slide. First of all, that interdependence um, produces a paradox, which is that the sympathy for strangers, what Adam Smith called sympathy, or we could call compassion for strangers, is not as unlimited as the interest in them. Right? Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and others predicted that self-interest would produce sympathy in equal measure. The same amount of sympathy. As you move forward in self-interest, sympathy would move in equal measure. Indeed, the appeal, one might say, of sympathy actually declines as the perceived needs of the stranger rises. So one of the uh, paradoxical outcomes of this is that the more the stranger appears to need us and we need the stranger, the appeal to sympathy what Mill and Smith thought would go automatically with interest actually declines. So that the stranger's needs tears at us. It sharpens as strangers come close and live among us, what we might call the near strangers, and live with us. Right? For some, their needs are seen to come at the expense of our neighbors, our vecinos, our friends, our relatives, the non-strangers. Right? That's the threat. For others, we rally to the cause of sympathy. We are Smithians. We're millions. Right? And these are two totally opposite uh, impulses. Each side understands the other. But in the course of the standoff between our attachment to strangers or our aversion to strangers, we become more intransigent. It's one of the reasons why our societies are so polarized over migration, trade, and blaming foreigners for everything that is wrong in our lives. That's one problem. The second is that interdependence produces contradictory structural effects. I'm not going to go into much detail on this. It's something that Leander and I worry about as economic historians. But one thing we know is that widening horizons does not yield bounty for everybody equally. 
Indeed, integration, this is the thing we're reckoning with now, finally after three decades of post-Cold War integration, yields inequality and hierarchy. And that produces, this is a little technical, a misalignment of incentives. It induces threatened powers who feel themselves sliding down the pole in this uh, increasingly uh, hierarchical world. Uh, it, it induces these threatened powers to try to exploit weaker ones. Well, can, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. And the third one on the list is that the stranger and the citizen don't hold hands. Right? They just don't. As horizons of opportunity widen, but the bonds thin out uh, between people, one thing that we've lost track of is that our deliberative institutions work best when the bonds are strong. In electoral democracies, the game produces incentives, then, for leaders to look for gains at the expense of those without voice or vote. Right? In other words, uh, the, the, the incentives, as uh, the political game in democracy functions, politicians, and, and, and let's just call them politicians, have an incentive they are motivated to seek gains among the people who can express voice and can vote for them, right? and not to the strangers who don't have a voice and don't have a voice, by definition. Right? So as societies become more stratified, democratic societies become more stratified, it induces, it creates a political game in which some members of the political class are motivated to turn the stranger into a pariah. Right? The unwelcomed one, the unwanted one. And you're on the road to stereotyping, uh, uh, racial beliefs, and, and so on. It is hard to reconcile deep interdependence with democracy. I just said hard, not impossible. But we have to reckon with the hardness of it, something that I believe the, let's say, euphoria light did not reckon with. Right? In fact, neglected it almost intentionally. We need to understand this so that we don't simply dismiss, the flip side is we don't simply dismiss Donald Trump, it's very tempting to do this, um, the Brexiteers as in English, we use the term nativist, uh, would be ethnocentric uh, nationalists, as simply backward reactionary forces. They, they may well be, but that doesn't help our understanding of what produces the conditions for their popularity. And in order to do that, we have to take this much more seriously than I believe, let's say, we progressives have. Um, where am I? So the history of the modern world is one about these two rival visions for handling the widening and the thinning problem. The urge to cooperate and the urge to compete. The urge to include and the urge to extract. For once the world was laced together right, into one piece, it was very rare for the parts to want to succeed, to, to leave. Uh, nobody made the case for exiting uh, the world system altogether. The question was how you were going to arrange it. For some, it was through cooperation, sympathy, compassion, finding a space for self-interest and, uh, uh, and, um, and compassion to join together, and another to put primacy over local self-interest, over those attach attachments, and to dominate and uh, to rely on extraction. So I want to just, for, for the time that remains here, three quick flashpoints, moments in history, very briefly, where we can see how the fight was over which of these two visions would win out. Let's start in 1893, because it's an old story. 1893, 
long, what we call the Victorian boom, the, the first age of globalization, relying on free trade, increasing customs union, mass migration around the world, intensified capital flows. And in 1893, there was a fair in Chicago, the World's Fair. These, um, ever since 1851 in London, the world would have these spectacular events in which people would showcase um, the breakthroughs in science and technology. At the World's Fair in Chicago, the first World's Religion Symposium was held where faiths from all around the world congregated. Indeed, it was, the, one might say, the high water year of internationalism. And Adam Smith, projected forward to 1893, would have concluded that this is what he would predict happened. Right? That convergence would produce a drive to mutual understanding. What he might not have seen, but which was true, was this is also an age of converging empires. So empires were getting now bumping up against each other from Japan, Russia, the West European powers in Africa. What happened in 1893 besides the World Fair? Well, first, there was the effect of a financial panic in Argentina and in the United States. But there was also a growing panic and fear about global enclosure. People began to talk about now that empires were covering the earth, running out of resources running out of primary products, running out of the bounty of the world. And in fact, one of the most famous American historians, um, a man called Frederick Jackson Turner, got up at the annual meeting of the American Historical Association, which was in Chicago, to coincide with the World's Fair, to announce that the American frontier was now closed. In a very famous presidential address to all of the historians, he said, the age of the frontier is gone. Right? This had echoes all over the planet. The growing sense of scarcity and the rise of land grabbing. Let's take one hot spot, East Asia. The rising Japanese power and the waning Chinese power with this sense of uh, enclosure around the world of running out of resources of now uh, empires bumping up against each other. We saw the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894. It's hard to exaggerate the consequences for a world of empire now that had gone from cooperating with each other and some from an African perspective, in fact, colluding with each other to partition Africa, now to becoming more competitive with each other, with a growing sense of scarcity and panic. And it would set in motion decades of conflict in the Pacific, one might say, that would only finally be resolved with the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So starting in 1894 and ending in 1945. Americans would take one look at this war and it would have effect on Spain, took one look at Japanese expansion and its ability to uh, defeat uh, a blow uh, to the Middle Kingdom in China with growing suspicion and alarm. And as the Spanish Empire began, the war and the conflict within the Spanish Empire began to break out once more in 1895, the United States, of course, took the opportunity, uh, seized the opportunity in 1898 to go to war with Spain, just like the other wars. Russians also watched this with earnest, with their drive to expand railroads across Siberia and into Manchuria, and they would wind up in a war with Japan in 1904. Similar hotspots all over the planet, in the Balkans, wherever empires bumped up each, against each other, and wherever people were engulfed in this panic about declining resources and financial uncertainty, the fires, the flames would burst out. Contained by summits and treaties, there was an effort to hold it all together, this cooperative versus this competitive urge. The lesson here from 1893 is that great powers contain escalation, 
but deepen the hierarchy. The weaker powers were drawn into the crisis and picked upon, like China and Turkey. So while we have a booming first age of globalization, the cracks were opening up, and they would finally spill out as the forces of competition won out over the forces of cooperation in 1914. So we, here we have a story, but you get a cycle of enclosure, interdependence, that winds up with the paradox of how can a world that is so interdependent at the same time go to war with itself? Let's go to another episode, 1933. This, of course, was not the high water mark of integration. Quite the opposite. It was the low water mark of integration. This is just one index of how the Great Depression, the shock of 1929, uh, drained the world of its interdependent flows. And this is a, a, of, of capital flows. We tend to look back on this as all just a breakdown. Um, but there were new experiments in efforts to try to uh, promote cooperation in the interwar years, partly fueled by the memory of the First World War. There were even efforts to ban war altogether. These are images from uh, the Kellogg-Briand Treaty, which made the use of foreign war illegal. But faced with the crisis of 1929, that spike, that old anxiety about scarcity, I think this is really a concern, began to resurface. Scarcity about diminishing resources, doomsday narratives about, and this is just one example from a German geographer who became very concerned about diminishing resources. This was then reinforced by racial anxieties about mixing and polluting races. And in this gloom, the great powers, and I mentioned this earlier, had faced increasing in incentives to wield their authority, not to end global integration, but to mold it to their interests because they were great powers. So we often look back, especially the doomsday nerves, as, uh, and see the rise of fascism as the emerging threat, or even the spread of communism. But in fact, the primary threats to global order came not from the autocratic regimes, but from the democracies. This is why we need to worry about globalization fatigue right here at home in our democracies. In 1930, the United States uh, approved the Smoot-Hawley tariff. In 1931, Japan, which was a democracy, invaded Manchuria. In 1932, my favorite episode of all, took place in Ottawa, where the British Empire powers decided to protect among themselves and it's something called the Ottawa uh, preferences, and to drive out dependence on other people. And other empires took note right, that one way of coping with the crisis of the Great Depression was to retreat behind walls, right, particularly walls where strong powers and weak powers can be conjoined. There was one last effort, of course, to salvage the world system in 1933 in London, it ended uh, in disasters with the collapse of the complete and final collapse of uh, the financial system. Two years later, Italy, so no more cooperation, Italy and Japan made plans following their cues from the democracies to invade the lands of strangers. And we begin, so this is the, the, the botched London summer of 1933, the effort to try to rescue the international payment system. Um, these are graphs uh, to show you the number of civilian casualties. This is before 1939, to see you how, to, to illustrate to you how many people were beginning uh, to be uh, atrocities in war. Um, before the outbreak of the Second World War. The lesson here is the trouble with democracy. The first lesson was how to handle competition between states. The second lesson was how democracies cope then with interdependence on strangers. We cannot guarantee that democracies are at the vanguard of enlightened interdependence. They're as vulnerable as the autocracies. I don't want to end on an ominous note, so I'll end on a positive note. In 1962, so we had 
1893, 1933, and in 1962. In this contest of Cold War, the Trente, it was the Trente Glorieuse, uh, the Cold War was heating up with Vietnam and Algeria. There were two very important narrative interventions. One was a narrative intervention as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought the world to the edge of a nuclear war. The takeaway was that we needed to create cooperative systems that would become our modern um, uh, uh, arms control uh, regime. So the lesson from that crisis was to try to control the expansion of nuclear weapons. And the second is less familiar to you, less familiar, is the work of a woman called Rachel Carson, who wrote a famous book, or a book that would become very famous, called Silent Spring, that was very important for rising environmental consciousness and the danger of what our modern age was doing to the resources, to the natural habitat of the planet. Both became pillars for our interdependence. And both looking for a nuclear arms regime and environmental regulation showed that democracies and autocracies could join together to ensure that cooperation might win out over, uh, over competition. Very important to all of this, of course, was the specter of the war, the Second World War. Um, and the sense that interdependence was now uh, not new, we'd become familiar with this. Uh, and so it was important that this infrastructure that got built up from the 1960s, that benefited from the memory of the war and the catastrophe of the Great Depression, in some senses created the foundations of our current global governance system. These three moments, right, so ending with the more positive one that you can grapple with the shared problems uh, by finding cooperative solutions, even in between adversaries, help us think about different responses to interdependence, to contain rivalry, right, and to expand cooperative solutions. The problem now, and here I end, we are living at the end of a long cycle of this process of integration. Since 1945, We've never been more dependent on strangers than now. Strangers have never been more dependent on us than ever. And the drive to deepen that interdependence reached its peak in 2015. And it was at that year that the convergence around the narrative of interdependence began uh, to break open. So that nowadays, this is 2015, we are torn. We are torn. So this is the picture you'll all be familiar with of Aiden Curdy. This is in September 2nd, 2015. And while I was watching this, because I'm involved in refugee education, I was looking at social responses to the crisis, already the fatigue of compassion. The woman on the right-hand side saying she's already being bombarded with these images of suffering strangers. So, to conclude, as we feel uh, a loss, just to end on these finer points, then the, the, the remember that interdependence means that the needs for strangers and strangers and need us can bring out the best, but also the worst. And that one reason for that is for the diminishing appeal of sympathy as the needs of strangers rise. Secondly, that interdependence produces hierarchy. It produces inequality. This is something that Marx foresaw and that economic historians have been reminding us for, for many years and that this produces a perverse alignment of incentives as the more powerful are motivated and incentivized to try to extract from the least powerful. And the final is, of course, that democracy and the stranger uh, uh, don't rest as easily together as we often believed. And that the dilemma of wider horizons of opportunity and thinner bonds is that people upon whom we depend do not have a voice within the boundaries of our political communities. I'll repeat that. That the people upon whom we depend, 
and who depend upon us do not have voice within the boundaries of our political communities. That's the structural dilemma of democracy in the global age. But our political institutions function best when the bonds between people are strong. So, nowadays, we have a breakdown between connections and actors. We have new forces emerging. We are both more interdependent and more anxious than ever. Where does it leave us? Well, it leaves us in a feeling of eternal limbo. But let me just end. Yes, moments and cycles do end. Is this over? I don't know. A lot will depend on how we handle this. It's, but one thing is for sure, that things don't end in the way we think that they do. According to the familiar scripts and narratives that we have, my own concern is that the catastrophists and the disaster narrative obsession with Trump, Putin, and others is that they are replaying old narratives in their heads. And I fear that they become self-filling prophecies as those narratives had in the 1930s. Then we really will have to worry about the cataclysm of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.